Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My talk here today is lattice scale inspection of semiconductor interfaces via non-destructive cameraless 3D T-ray imaging. I am Anis Rahman, founder and CTO of Applied Research and Photonics Incorporated located in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I'm extremely pleased to be able to share uh, some of our work with this distinguished audience at the ASMC 2021. So uh, the plan is to uh, explain the interfaces, but before that I'll go through some introductory remarks and cameraless uh, imaging principle and technique. So, uh, Nanometrology is the key topic here. In general, metrology means measurement. So as the old saying goes, if you cannot measure it, you cannot control it or manage it. So measurement is the key of no matter what we do in each and every places. In case of the semiconductor interfaces and semiconductor in general, as the line width are getting smaller and smaller, um, um, the uh, sub nanometer resolution imaging without electron microscope or AFM or STM is, uh, is important but remains as a challenge. So uh, that, that is the topic that we will cover here. Uh, our company called Applied Research and Photonics or ARP, uh, we started back in uh, many years ago and slowly slowly we came forward um, we were able to demonstrate uh, the less than one nanometer resolution with bigger wavelength which is T-ray back in 2016 and then in 2018 we achieved uh, angstrom resolution or less than one angstrom resolution to be able to see the atomic lattice with this um, bigger wavelength of T-ray. So in doing so, we had to uh, uh, go through this uh, fundamental breakthrough of overcoming the Abi diffraction limit. The, as you can uh, see, the um, image resolution uh, is dependent on the wavelength of the live light. And in 1873, Ernest Abbey established that the smallest object one can see uh, cannot be less than the half the wavelength of the light being used to image. So the electron microscope was discovered and because electron wavelengths are smaller than the atomic lattice, uh, so they can see uh, the lattice resolution, they can create lattice resolution image. Uh, but uh, but you know, um, not everybody can afford or use an electron microscope, uh, and it's not an easy instrument. Uh, I, for one, have vast experience with electron microscope during my graduate uh, student life. So, um, question to answer is: Can we overcome the Abbe diffraction limit? Now, let me also mention that. Uh, an equally important or actually even more important question is, is overcoming the diffraction limit enough? And the answer is no. Because if you are using even let's say um, UV of 256 nanometer wavelength, half of that 128 is not nearly enough to see uh, the atomic uh, lattice. So uh, overcoming the diffraction limit is important but just overcoming it does not give you the, um, the uh, resolution that one needs. So we came up with a strategy of incorporating a nano scanner and the principle of Beer Lambert's law rewritten in terms of the reflectance and, and then using a computer algorithm uh, to generate the image from the reflection matrix. And I will explain a bit of that. But first, let me, first let, let me <laughs> explain or, or introduce the T-ray. As you probably already know, the terahertz radiation or T-ray lies in between far infrared 
uh, or infrared and microwave because there is overlap with far infrared. So the T-ray or terahertz radiation is also known as millimeter wave, also known as far IR uh, or back wave. So um, as you can see, there is overlap with the uh, far IR and, um, and uh, close to microwave. Uh, it used to be T-ray gap or terahertz gap because there was no high power man-made uh, source. Um, and people have been uh, trying uh, since late 80s um, when the first T-ray was uh, uh, made from. So these are the traditional ways of generating terahertz uh, radiation or T-ray. Photoconductor or photo switch is the legacy technology. Uh, everybody is using that in a sense. Um, the challenge with that is that first of it uh, first of all it needs a femtosecond pulsed laser or pump laser which by itself is an emerging technology it doesn't have a lot of power uh, it generates only on the order of microwatts of power and also the bandwidth is very limited then bob carl group demonstrated difference frequency generation also uh, the, their uh, setup was very low power, but it requires two lasers. To align two lasers are much more challenging. And uh, the materials uh, also, be, um, you know, because of this photo mixing kind of technology, uh, it's a uh, high chi to material is important. So, um, uh, you know, we came up with this dendrimer dipole excitation, and I will explain uh, that a little bit. Uh, because it doesn't require a femtosecond pulse laser, it does not require high voltage or vacuum. It is very small compact size and uh, all operations are under the ambient conditions. And uh, it, it gives us very stable continuous wave high power and high bandwidth T-ray or terahertz. So um, as, as I showed before the terahertz gap, and how do we uh, how do we then generate the terahertz? Is uh, the cartoon at the bottom? As you can see, the uh, we use a, um, a polymeric uh, molecule, which is a spherical molecule, not like a linear chain polymer. Uh, and this polymeric molecule called dendrimer. And when we dope that with a chromophore, uh, it creates the dipole uh, population inside and around the molecule. And we can then excite that dipole with uh, a suitable uh, pump laser. And then uh, the dipole relaxation or, or dipole um, excitation and then decay produce the terahertz radiation. So the mechanism, so uh, here is a uh, energy level diagram when we pump with uh, omega-1. Uh, then uh, the quasi-stable um, states in the uh, band gap, um, you know, then uh, a <coughs> is, is formed. And then the uh, subsequent decay okay, gives us the terahertz. With that, um, yeah, we, we make the terahertz instrument uh, here in Harrisburg. Pennsylvania, so this is made in USA, and uh, and then uh, a, a standard setup looks like uh, on the top uh, on the optical table. You can organize the spectrometer and the nano scanner, uh, etc. So the laboratory prototype is shown on the right, uh, as you can see that box, uh, which is uh, a prototype box on the main spectrometer. And the next to it is a scanner. It's a live demo was made to the students and postdocs a little while ago. The concept is uh, between the camera lists and a camera mechanism are outlined here. As you can see on the top, uh, in the camera we have a focusing lens and we have a CCD or some kind of focal plane array. That array then uh, gives out the signal. The signal is processed by the ASIC inside the camera and image is generated as well as files are saved. In, in this uh, case, in the camera less case, we have 
to this nano scanner that digitizes an object in three dimension chosen by the resolution and area as to volume chosen by the user and the, the gives us the 3d matrix or reflection matrix and that 3d reflection matrix is uh, then uh, passed through the algorithm by computer and image is generated so uh, this is uh, algorithm what we call is a inverse distance to power equation that uh, has um, been used uh, to generate the images um, two things is important if we scan the same feature over and over again we should get the same profile which is the case on the upper left and uh, the other thing we can rewrite the bear lambert's law in terms of intensity because every uh, the reflected intensity is material dependent so so that that's uh, lets us to discriminate between material mat material to material and we can also gives us the ability to uh, contrast generation of the contrast from which the image is formed um, so the the pros and cons of cameraless uh, scientific imaging is this um, advantages are it doesn't require a camera no sys camera no ccd no cmos resolution can be chosen by the user not limited by the uh, camera itself and resolution can be from macro scale down to angstrom uh, it doesn't uh, because we are using t-ray no sample preparation like electron microscope uh, then independent of sample size and shape so that means sample can be solid liquid gaseous um, and uh, sub surface and subsurfaces um, you know layer by layer uh, volume image measurement of size and thickness a lot of other things can be done as i will show equivalent functionality as a fmscm tem and it's a tabletop system can be installed in clean room um, or inline inspection situation etc the downside the cons are the needs a scanner nano scanner uh, and it's not in real time like a camera you can see the image right away in this case the, we first have to digitize and then create the image not in real time uh, lattice resolution scanning takes time uh, if we want to get a rough scan that goes very fast but if we have to do the lattice scale resolution imaging that scanning is so fine a scan that it takes time and also the other thing is that this kind of uh, in electron microscope you can uh, because backscatter x-ray are produced from that x-ray one can do the elemental analysis and here because the bonds are not broken samples uh, are very unperturbed it just it was only uh, probing the sample without uh, disturbing its intrinsic states therefore no elemental analysis is mostly for molecular analysis all kind of molecular analysis can be done here and also the camera is a, is a handheld device and this one is still not handheld but uh, we are working on it down the road it can be handheld so in problem in semiconductor industry is that one blank wafer when all the devices are built on it it's its value jumps from hundred dollar to a million dollar and the process development takes very long because seeing under the surface is is not possible without uh, just, uh, without breaking uh, the specimen so uh, you know so that is the problem that we are solving here we're giving less than one angstrom resolution we don't have to break it we can still see under the surface in fact this is the only technology that can see under the surface layer by layer without breaking it in an indestructible way so uh, the semiconductor interfaces play critical roles in all semiconductor fabrication processes and on the electronic properties of the devices effective characterization of interfaces is complicated because of inherent unknowns because the deposition involves transforming a solid material into vapor or liquid phase and then back into solid by the deposition process in uh, therefore um, the deposited layers um, 
uh, lattice uh, suffers from lattice imperfections and defects such as stacking fault, dislocations, inclusion, etc. And uh, so, so the characterization is uh, of, the, of the interface is very important for the functionality of the of the device built from from these semiconductors. And in fact, there have been five different kind of interfaces that have been uh, defined: uh, misfit lattice, identical lattice, uh, rough surface diffusion type, and mismatch compound semiconductor header interface type. Type five, so that's type one through type five, uh, and and some of the, um, most of the types I will explain here in this talk. Um, uh, but before that, uh, let me show you the imaging uh, uh, done by this technique. On the left, there is a segment of a patterned wafer. We can see uh, um, when you take the scan or the profile along that cursor, the red line. Uh, then you can see the there is some small differences between die to die to die. On the right, you can see that uh, a an, another wafer, a segment of 200 millimeter wafer, that shows some area in the middle have quite a bit of defect. And if you take the profile of that, then you can see the on the left the good area and the right the bad area showing the pattern differences. So, uh, and, and, and then we, you know, with that you can also, with the same technique, you can also see layer by layer in, in three dimension. And the layer by layer can be on any of the three orthogonal planes. So, uh, now uh, um, here are the example uh, of, uh, of interface analysis. So, when it comes to interface analysis, first thing we also need to do is uh, uh, is to measure the thickness of the layers. Let's say it's an epitaxial semiconductor or some other way of deposited layers. So we, we must measure the layer thicknesses. So if we take a three-dimensional picture uh, like the one here um, that shows the perspective, but then we can take only one face and measure the thickness of different layers. The very top two layers are shown here. One is about 18 nanometer. The other one is about 10 nanometer. So, uh, but also here uh, on the 3D, um, uh, it shows uh, some imperfections uh, of the layers as well. Now, uh, the 3D image uh, shows the uh, interfaces of different layers. So this is a different sample. On the left, I'm, I have a one cubic micron uh, image, uh, which is the same image here from a different angle, from different sides uh, highlighted. So um, we can zoom on uh, to, here is a, again, um, this, um, this image over here is uh, also one micron by one micron surface extracted from the one cubic uh, micron 3D image. And then here the layers are identified, layer one, layer two, layer three, layer four, and layer five. Uh, and here on the right is another uh, sample that has um, uh, layer one and layer two. So uh, the interfaces are there are different kind of interfaces that now we can identify from these images. Uh, one is uh, what you call is a misfit lattice image, type one. Uh, and then uh, type two is the identical lattice image. Type three is the rough surface image, uh, rough surface interface. And type four is the diffusion type interface. And there is a fifth type that, that has not been outlined over here. So from these images, we can see that this one on the upper right is the interface between two similar lattices or identical lattice image, which is type two. We still can see the um, line that, went, that goes from one side to the other between the two group of, of layers or two layers. And then <clears throat> this 
image shows uh, different interfaces between layer one and layer two, which is a rough surface. Uh, between layer two and layer three is more like a diffusion controlled image. Between layer three and layer four is also seems like a diffusion controlled image. And layer four and layer five are the um, are an, a, a, another rough surface image. So here <clears throat> the misfit, misfit lattice image is between layer three and layer four. So this picture such an image on the lattice scale let us clearly identify and quantify uh, the images, uh, the, the interfaces, uh, their uh, type, their lattice properties, and uh, and also their thicknesses of uh, respective layers. Now, <clears throat> for other examples, I have a image of a nanograin distribution. On the left is a more like a metallic layer, a uh, different kind of metallic layer that was deposited um, by some technique. Uh, and on, on the right, it's a, it is also deposited layer, but this is a carbon sample. Uh, one other example is uh, carbon layers. On the left, we have a high density uh, deposited carbon layers 3D image, which is 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer by 100 nanometer. And that shows the, um, the different uh, organization of the amorphous carbon lattice. Uh, and on the right, it's a low density, uh, the same process, but because of the low density carbon, so the nanostructures are different. There are missing material on top, which is clearly uh, visible as well as can be quantified. Uh, one other example I'm going to show here today is uh, called nanoscale interaction between the quantum dots and ionic polymer. So this is a TEM image that shows that quantum dots are about uh, 11 or so nanometer. Uh, and from the uh, T-ray image, uh, we also measure it's about uh, 11 nanometer uh, particle size, but there are particle size distribution, which is also visible from TEM images. And then there is a 3D um, image over here. This data is published in Macromolecule. Um, and then we can see the interactions clearly from a close up. Um, on the left, <clears throat> this sample is as synthesized. And then on the right, the sample was swelled in the eye water overnight. That shows the, uh, because of the swelling, <clears throat> the lattice structure is a lot more organized. At least the quantum dots placings are a lot more uniform than as synthesized. <clears throat> and then uh, different layer thicknesses, which is uh, constituted by the uh, the central um, quantum dot and, uh, around which the polymer uh, and water layers are, are there. So now we can measure the thicknesses of each layer and their orientation and organizations. So this is in the um, uh, in the in the scale that we have determined their thicknesses of, the, of different layers, uh, and you know that is their their variation. Um, uh, here's another example of layer by layer analysis uh, and as well as the uh, grain size can be measured from this kind of profile. Uh, so now we can quantify uh, the amorphous materials uh, on different grain properties. Uh, but also we found that there are nano voids within that uh, alumina structure and we can also measure the nano void sizes. That uh, let me uh, conclude by saying that RV diffraction limit has been overcome by terahertz multispectral reconstructive imaging as implemented herein. Uh, achieved sub nanometer image resolution with uh, terahertz radiation in the x, y, and z directions. Actually, it's an angstrom uh, scale resolution or sub angstrom scale resolution combination of a smart nano scanning spectrometer and 
algorithm replaces a CCD for sub nanometer resolution. It is non destructive, non contact, subsurface layer by layer analysis ability, inspect 2D and 3D uh, nanomaterials. It can identify lattice defects, stacking faults, uh, other kind of defects, inclusions, cracks, non uniformity, phase change, etc. And not to mention the interface uh, analysis uh, between different layers of deposited material can be identified, quantified, and characterized. So with that, I thank you for your attention.